Great. Welcome, everyone. Just letting folks trickle into the Zoom. I appreciate you all here on this lovely Wednesday. Slowly but swiftly, they're coming in. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us uh, for the Institute for Rebooting Social Media's Fall Speaker Series today. My name is Shelby Elitmani. I'm a program coordinator with the Institute. And today, we welcome George Washington University law professor, Marianne Franks, to discuss her new book, Fearless Speech, Breaking Free from the First Amendment. Uh, but first, I'm pleased to introduce our moderator for today, co-founder and faculty director of the Berkman Klein Center, Jonathan Citrin. Thank you, Shelby. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much, Marianne, for joining us and for discussing your new book. It must still be good to see like your work actually in material form and not your first book, right? That's right. Uh, also wrote The Cult of the Constitution. Indeed. And I, maybe a great way to get started uh, is just to get a sense of what brought you to these topics. How did you first either decide, I want to be a law professor, or I want to be a law professor who studies the First Amendment, mm -hmm and the sorts of subjects that you take up. Well, first, thanks for having me. I'm really pleased to be here. And yeah, the, the path to my being a law professor was pretty circuitous and pretty haphazard, I have to say. I saw myself for the longest time as a, a, a pure academic. I was a philosopher. I was an English literature major, double major in philosophy, and I thought that's who I was going to be, a humanities professor. and. Um, the, the job market kind of hit me in the face a little bit when I came out with my degree and realized that nobody really wanted a person who had uh, expertise in philosophy and literature, um, at least not for steady employment. So I was thinking along two lines. One was practically, were there more practical things that I could do um, in terms of my career, but also I was thinking in terms of what I really wanted to do in my life and realized that the topics that I wrote about, even though I always cared about the things I was writing about, I wanted an audience that wasn't just academics. I wanted an audience that wasn't just people who um, were doing heavy theory, right? So I thought, you know, what do I think is really going on in the world? And what are some models of, of, of people who are doing things that I admire? And it was really a lot of people with law degrees who were making policy or changing legislation or having conversations about why it was that people do what they do and why they hurt other people and how we can try to stop them. And that's really what led me to law school and law school led me to wanting to teach was all of those big picture questions that I tried to answer in the humanities realm and tried to, I tried to retain some of that as well, but really wanted to put it in focus of how can I make that kind of work matter for the day to day, right? Are there laws that should be changed? Are there social movements that need to be lifted up? So that's really how I came to become a law professor and, and very much became focused on issues like the First and Second Amendment because so much of those amendments and the feelings people have about the Constitution are uh, vital to what we think of as our society for better or for worse. People care so much about freedom of speech, they care so much about the right to bear arms, they care about other things too, but those are the two that I have found really get people it's not just that people who study the law want to talk about those things. Everyone has a feeling about those two amendments, and in particular, the First Amendment. So that was why I wrote the, the first book, The Cult of the Constitution. It was a kind of recognition that the way that people thought about the Constitution was very reminiscent of the kind of religious fundamentalist upbringing I had in, as a Southern Baptist in Arkansas, the sense of taking a text and believing that it spoke meaningfully to you personally, and that you personally had the view on it that was the correct one and everyone else was a blasphemer. That seemed very much like the way that people tended to talk about the First and Second Amendments. But after I wrote that book, I also really wanted to write something that was a bit more constructive. I wanted to not only diagnose what I thought was going wrong with the First Amendment, but also try to offer some paths forward to think differently about the things that really do matter. Freedom of expression is, of course, a really important value. The language generally is a really important value. Speech is incredibly powerful. And the feeling that I uh, kept having as I was studying um, First Amendment doctrine and the way that 
it either does or doesn't show up for people in their lives and throughout history is really the sense of a mismatch between what we're told about the First Amendment and what the reality is. That we're told that the First Amendment shows up for the revolutionaries, the radicals, the marginalized, the dissenters, um, and that the reason why we have to tolerate anti-democratic um, discriminatory speech is so that we protect the really good speech. And I think that's, that's basically a lie. I think that what we've really done with the First Amendment is we have not protected the people who have been radical and revolutionary and pro-democracy, but we have shown up for the anti-democratic, so we've really um, messed up the scale for speech. And then we've also expanded that, that model of the First Amendment to other institutions, even though, as we all know, the First Amendment is just about what the government can't do to you in terms of your speech, but it keeps being replicated as the model for universities or the model for social media platforms or the model for basically every conversation people have, and I think it's a real mistake. It might be helpful to really dig into that by explaining a little bit more about what might be the discount between the kind of free and fearless speech you want. And it might be helpful to really describe that. You hinted at it by saying uh, that that's what a lot of people think the First Amendment is protecting. Uh, separating that from what you're saying the reality of the First Amendment is. So I don't know if you want to dig into that a little more. Um, because it's, it feels near universal that if we're in the world of like even the Apple ad of 1984, uh, of not having things be stultifying and everybody lined up in agreement and a breath of fresh air in the form of a hammer through a screen, or the more recent Apple ad, I don't know why I'm on Team Apple at the moment, but uh, it adheres to the strivers and to the mavericks and to the people, you know, exactly that thing is tapping into a cultural consensus that may even to this day at that level be holding. But where is it falling short? I think it's falling short first in the sense that it's not true descriptively. And then we think about it, if it's not true descriptively, what is it actually doing, right? So on the descriptive part, what I start the book with is examples of really powerful, fearless speech. Like yeah, we can, I, I you know, we can just dial it. down the microphone volume a tiny bit. Can I just, uh, We're getting feedback. That sounds like it's really louder. Close to somebody declaring censorship in progress. I was about to say, I always try to make that joke. Is that better or worse? Or we're going to find out. Um, I'll try again. Does that sound okay in the back? Okay. I'm also going to lean forward. I'm, these chairs are extremely. They, they make me really want to recline, <laughs> but I, I think I should probably be perched a bit more. So. So this idea that we have that, that the First Amendment is for the rebels, for the mavericks, for, for the people who are really pushing the envelope. Um, where I start the book is I look at throughout history, both the United States history, I look at other countries, and I look at all the things that I would classify as examples, and they're only examples, of extremely courageous speech. And I think about how none of them really involved the First Amendment. So the, the real genesis for this piece was reading about the White Rose Movement, which some of you may know about. The White Rose Movement, the student resistance movement in uh, Germany, uh, it was a tiny uh, student movement, and two of the students who were involved were at the University of Munich, Sophie Scholl and her brother, and what happens to them is that Sophie Scholl and her brother have these pamphlets that they're giving out, and they're, they're anonymous, they're signed by the White Rose, and they're trying to give voice to um, they're trying to explain what the actual, what the reality is on the ground for the Nazis and what they're doing and the amount of um, uh, atrocities that they are committing. And they're, they're trying to leaflet the University of Munich, but they are, they're um, standing over this kind of bridge area and they realize that they don't have much time because they might get caught. And so they just kind of send the rest of them sort of floating down from this area, these pamphlets trying to give voice to this resistance movement to the Nazis, and they're caught by the janitor, who is a, a member of the Nazi party, and very quickly they're arrested, they're tortured, they're interrogated, and they're sentenced to die by the guillotine. And Not for littering, but for, ideas, for ideas that are 
antithetical to the state. That you know, the, the Nazis radical. were promoting this idea that what they were doing was just, that it was a, a good cause, that they needed to do this in self-defense, that the kinds of things that were happening, the war was going well, and they were pointing out things like we are this is what we are doing um, to the vulnerable populations, this is what's happening to the Jews. And that's why they were um, sentenced. And it was in this courtroom where they're not allowed to speak in their own defense, so there's there's no sort of due process here. And Sophie, who is like 20 or 21 years old at this point, she's just yelling anyway. She just interrupts the judge and says, we had to do what we had to do because we somebody had to speak up. And if we start, then maybe other people are going to speak up too. But so far, why isn't that, it would, it would appear, just a classic example of like, I mean, where do you start with the problems of Nazi Germany? But the, a strong First Amendment, even in its classic doctrinal form, would be a problem for an authoritarian regime. So wouldn't the First Amendment have helped there? You would think it would be, except that when we look at our own history, and we look for examples like this, and one of the, the earliest examples I can think of, and what I start the introduction with, are the abolitionists, right? The people who are saying slavery is an evil and we need to abolish it. It generated so much angry sentiment, right? That the people who were speaking out against the evils of slavery were often persecuted by mobs, they were lynched, they were shot. They, the people who were running presses who were trying to print uh, the truth about slavery and all of its horrors, those presses were burned to the ground. So I opened the introduction with Ida Wells and the burning of her newspaper, which was called The Free Speech, uh, burning to the ground by, by a white mob. And you look at this and you think, well, where was the First Amendment for Ida Wells? And at that point, the First Amendment wasn't even thought of in those terms as maybe protecting that kind of speech. And so for the longest period of time in the United States, it wasn't showing up for people who were doing the most radical thing. And just that maybe it's worth a little bit of the inside baseball. At that time, that was so-called pre-incorporation. Yes. And I, I don't know how much of the uh, action there was under color of the state versus... Well, exactly. I mean, so, so when we start to get into those details yeah. and say, well, because it wasn't incorporated yet or because the state action doctrine wouldn't have kicked in, this is part of my point to say that if you and, think and, Sorry, just incorporation is to say it doesn't just prevent Congress or the federal government from restricting speech. The First Amendment protects against state or municipal or public university encroachment upon speech. That is post-incorporation, which is roughly 1919? I think it's right. So it's around yeah. the time of the Whitney case and Shank yeah. and the others. Um, and you have, so you have for, for until this period, right, until you get to the early 1900s, there's not even a sense in which there is a legal right. Now, some people thought they had a legal right. Elijah Lovejoy talked about his right to freedom of expression right before he was gunned down by the, the, the white mob that was so angry about the things he was um, saying. So there are people who thought that it meant something, but it didn't actually mean anything in this context. And then you have to trace it throughout this history to see okay, there's incorporation, and then there's the state acting doctrine, and then there's all these exceptions. And again, if you think about all the dramatic things that are happening in society, when women, for instance, were advocating for the right to vote, and they were being beaten in front of the White House, they were arrested for blocking traffic, and they were carted off to prison, and they were beaten and tortured there. That's direct state action. That is definitely something that should have applied there, and it didn't matter at all. And we think about just a few years ago about the woman who burst out laughing during Jeff Sessions' confirmation hearing, right, that she was arrested and tried twice. So when you think about how we say, well, the First Amendment in theory should have prevented all of those things, but it didn't. So if it doesn't show up for the abolitionists, if it doesn't show up for the suffragettes, if it doesn't show up for the Black Lives Matter protesters, if it doesn't show up for women who have made, uh, who have become sexual violence whistleblowers, then who is it showing up for? So in that case, the disjunct between what people think is what the First Amendment is for in theory uh, is both historically there's a disjunct, but okay, now we're in 20th century, early 21st century, and the First Amendment has come into its own, someone might say. Uh, but then there's a disjunct between even the First Amendment as we have it now and the way in which it is applied that if it is not done evenly, and if the unevenness is not random, but in fact might be mappable to the vulnerable versus not, or however we might uh, want to map it, is the idea that the resolution is to try to recommit to the basic contours of the First Amendment doctrinally as we know it today, or is it to say, 
no, these inconsistencies are so fundamental that the whole framework is ineffectual and we need something else. I gather you're in camp two on that. Not exactly. Okay. So the first part of what I'm trying to say in the book is to correct the doctrinal or to, to try to accurately portray the fact that what the First Amendment's job actually is, which is to protect us from government punishment of our speech, that it's failing at that job. So that's one part of the book is to say, let's say the First Amendment in theory is wonderful. That is what we can all agree upon, or at least I, we would have been able to say we could all agree upon at some point was that what the First Amendment actually does is only restrains the government from prohibiting your speech based on its content. And there are exceptions to this, of course. And I would say the, the First Amendment has utterly failed to do that. For which you might then have common cause with classic civil libertarians, with the Floyd Abramses of the world, who would say, maybe not, I don't know, I can't tell. Well, it depends on which Floyd Abrams, because if you think about the, the most recent Floyd Abrams, right? Is I'm the, thinking is, like late 20th century Floyd Abrams rather than okay, 19th well, century Floyd Abrams. Well, so, I mean, more recently when Floyd Abrams famously defended uh, the First Amendment in a major case that he was on the opposite side of the ACLU. This is the Clearview AI case some of you may be familiar with. ACLU says um, for a company to be gathering people's biometric data without their consent and, and distributing it without their consent is a violation of privacy. It violates an Illinois state law that says you can't do that. And on the other side, Clearview AI was saying what we're doing is speech and their lawyers, Floyd Abrams. And in fairness, uh, or just so people know, Clearview AI is the uh, startup that just started scraping photos and associated tags from tons of different LinkedIn profiles, Facebook pages, et cetera, and then created a universal facial recognition engine so that a photo or video of anybody arbitrarily taken can likely lead to an identification of who they are. Um, of course, I guess that wasn't Floyd Abrams in his public intellectual capacity. That was Floyd Abrams in his hire a lawyer capacity. I don't know. He doesn't have to take that case. And, and in the last few times when he has spoken about um, some of the free speech issues on panels, he is he has defended the position that what Clearview AI is doing is freedom of speech. And, but though interesting, we're now suddenly on ground where you're pointing out, as you and others have long pointed out, some of the tensions between <laughs> classic First Amendment doctrine and privacy, yes. that if there's some private fact that we think should be protected under law, that does mean often restricting the speech of the person who wants to utter the private fact to another person or to the public, but that starts to sound like pulling back on, on First Amendment protections if you, because you're on team privacy there, is that right? Well, I would say that what the team I'm on is actually team consistency. And, and the, first, the First Amendment has never been that. Because when the Supreme Court decides that it does like to protect private information, it just does it. And when it decides it doesn't want to, it just doesn't. So it's not as though there is a coherent First Amendment doctrine to say we're going to split away from that. And you think about the fact that, that I'll, I'll say personally, when it comes to the Clearview AI litigation, what preceded that was a similar set of facts of what some people may um, have heard of as revenge porn, right? Someone taking your intimate photo and publishing it without consent. So I um, helped draft model legislation that actually beca became the law in several states to say that should be illegal. Um, and the ACLU comes out and says, no, 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 that's free speech. So you could articulate those sides as my view being that is privacy, the ACLU says that's free speech. The courts have agreed with me up until this point have said, actually, we think that this is like medical information, financial information, so many other things that already exist that have never thought to raise a First Amendment challenge. But the ACLU says, no, you're wrong. That's actually freedom of speech. Which one of us is doing the First Amendment correctly? In your view, between those two examples, is the consistency you're looking for to be, whether it's photos and identification of people through Clearview or protection of people for having their intimate images shared publicly, mm -hmm. both ought to be things the state could reasonably prescribe. The First Amendment should not reach that. I think that's right. Uh-huh. And then Earlier, however, you were talking about laughing at a hearing where you want to make sure that the state mm -hmm. can't regulate that the way it was trying to regulate that. Yes. And I guess then maybe the takeaway is if we look for patterns in what might appear as inconsistent application of First Amendment doctrine, you're saying it tends to be 
when it is a vulnerable person for which holding back the government from protecting that person in the name of the First Amendment is going on, it's the vulnerability that's counting against them rather than some mm-hmm. taken in a test tube First Amendment test. Yes. And that one way to describe that, we can call it vulnerability, or we can say too, and sometimes I borrow the language from Derek Bell and talk about interest convergence. There are moments where the First Amendment says, we will protect some civil rights speech, we will protect some women's speech, we'll sometimes selectively allow people to say things that are troubling for, let's say, the underlying um, historical values of the United States, but only up until the point at which they start to really diverge, I think, from those. So the, the more, I guess, provocative version of my thesis is, The United States was built on uh, racial patriarchy, the idea that white wealthy men were the ones who supposedly had all the rights and everybody else was excluded. And there's this terrible moment for us um, as modern day citizens to try to figure out what did they mean when they say we the people when they meant excluding other people. So how do we deal with that as our history? And my point is to say that if you really want to talk about uh, describing what's happened with the First Amendment, it's not about consistent principles, it's about power. It's about, well, how often do we defend people who are converging in some ways with that notion of racial patriarchy, or at least not disturbing it too much, and how much happens when you start to disturb it that you then crack down on? And I think the answer is power is a much better way to explain that than any kind of consistent or um, noble value. Mm -hmm. So what's, if that's the case, and this gets back a little bit to the reason you did a sequel to the Call to the Constitution, how would you characterize the right way to do things? If you're having, imagine you're now Justice Franks and in a stunning turnover of Supreme Court membership, there are uh, four other folks who are feeling like they read your book, they're excited about your theories, and you're having your first lunch in the Supreme Court dining room what are you taking a hatchet to first? Taking a hatchet to? I or think, what are you building next? I think one thing we'd really want to get to is, is uh, two cases. I, I would want to, I want to revisit Counterman versus Colorado, and I'd want to revisit 303 Creative. Counterman versus Colorado, a case in which uh, you had a guy stalking somebody online, sending them message after message that sure, even by maybe in any objective standard, appeared threatening. Yeah. And uh, the person didn't want to reply because that might egg them on, but you would think that blocking him and then he creates another and gets blocked again would be enough of a signal. And what did the court hold? And the court says, in a really convoluted fashion, they said the only way that we can really address this case or the way that we're choosing to address this issue is not by treating stalking as its own category. We're going to say it has to be justified on the grounds of an exception to First Amendment doctrine. And the only exception to First Amendment doctrine that it would fit would be true threats. And they said, when it comes to our true threats doctrine, our standard is going to be, it's not enough if the speech in question is objectively terrifying. That's not good enough. It's got to be at a minimum that the defendant in question was reckless with regard to whether or not it was going to be perceived as threatening. So reckless here meaning, not necessarily that you intended to do it, but that you consciously thought about the risk that someone would be terrified by this, and you did it anyway without any particularly legitimate reason. And what that means in the stalking context, as as stalking experts in the case had pointed out, and it was interesting there because there were um, several amicus briefs written by First Amendment scholars in that case. I I headed up one of those. There was another one. um, There were lots on both sides of the issue, which was really interesting. But stalking experts were pointing out that especially when it comes to the dynamic of stalking, There's the delusional stalker who is absolutely subjectively convinced that what he is doing is not terrifying but romantic. And that means that they are incapable of being reckless because they don't have the subjective state of mind Not that they wouldn't be incapable, but but it would be much harder to prove against that person that they're in fact being reckless because they could just say, I genuinely thought she was going to love what I'm doing. And if I just do it a thousand more times, she will really come, you know. And for which that's now, is that still on remand? It's sent back to the court to apply this new standard? They're basically saying it has to be recklessness to the extent that, you know, Colorado was very upfront about saying we used only a sub- um, the objective standard right. and we have to go back and figure out if he's, if he's um, guilty. But now in Counterman, that's a Kagan opinion. Yeah. So uh, if we go back to our Supreme Court lunchroom. Yeah. Um, it's going to take a lot of turnover on the court. Yeah, I was going to say with the current court, your two 
fellow travelers <laughs> no. are Amy Coney Barrett and, and Justice, Justice Thomas. Thomas, who wrote a dissent to that, saying that that's nonsense. It should just be an objective standard. Yeah, not so much Thomas. Barrett, I'll take. But Barrett was really interesting in this in this particular um, dissent, where she says you're not paying attention to what the practical realities are for domestic violence victims, and it was really quite unfortunate because in a very similar case that kind of teed up this case many years ago, called Alanis. Um, Justice Alito at that time had sounded like he understood this. He, he had said domestic violence abusers, domestic abusers will use the First Amendment as this kind of pretext for terrifying their victims and we shouldn't let them do it. I don't know what happened to that Justice Alito. Lots of things have happened to Alito, I guess, in the last few years, but he was with the majority. And yes, you only got Barrett and Thomas saying that that was wrong. So this is a very difficult decision to, to contend with. But yes, we're saying now unless you intended it or at least thought about the risk, then you can't be convicted of stalking. So I haven't seen any polling or something on that, but my guess is, and as you said, the amici were on both sides of this, that plenty of First Amendment purists mm -hmm. would still say that that kind of behavior, especially amplified by new technologies in our current configuration, just wasn't there in the late 20th century, that the First Amendment could reasonably be interpreted not to reach that. That Counterman came out wrong mm -hmm. and that Barrett and Thomas have the better of it and that that should be the standard. So that sounds like something you're ready to flip and that, you know, I don't know where Floyd Abrams was on that, but whoever our stand-ins are for First Amendment lions, mm -hmm. that many of them might be with you. Well, the ACLU was firmly on the stalker side, so, uh -huh. and so was the EFF. I'm so sure they would say it was a, they were on the First Amendment side, but yes. It would, and that's exactly yes. why I want to keep saying, and that means you were on the stalker side, and you have to confront the fact that that's what that means. And, yeah. and what was so frustrating, I talk about this in the book, what was so frustrating about the way ACLU and EFF attorneys talked about the case is that they never talked about the facts of the case. They said, people who are making political statements that might be hyperbolic are a little more free today. Yeah is not what that case was about. And so there's this dodge. If you're going to commit to this kind of version of the First Amendment that will mean that more women, frankly, will die, then own it. How much is it, in your view, fair in doing the classic First Amendment balancing tests that the court often finds itself doing in these corner cases to think not only about the case and the facts in front of the court and the parties, how much is the plaintiff uh, or the victim in the counterman case uh, feeling afraid, but on the general impact of public discourse and a freedom to live one's life and you know pursue happiness mm -hmm. generally, is it okay to zoom the camera out to the larger picture? I would say it would, I would take as a as an improvement of the status quo any acknowledgement that there's a balance at all. So if you read the counterman opinion, there is no discussion except somewhat in the dissent about the cost to the speech of the victim of stalking. So the victim in this case was a musician and she stopped performing because she was so terrified of this person. He sent her thousands and thousands of messages over a period of six years. She had tried to ignore them for several years until she asked a lawyer friend in the family to look him up to see if he was dangerous. He had a previous felony conviction for threatening family members. And so she's terrified of this person. She stops performing, has so much anxiety, leaves the state. And there's nothing in the opinion about the cost of free speech for her, nothing. What there is is, well, there might be some hyperbol there might be some speaker out there, hypothetically. Even Kagan's opinion doesn't talk about counterman as if he were counterman. Forget about saying it's not just these facts, let's look at the rest. She doesn't look at these facts at all. She just says, hypothetically, someone could say something they didn't really mean and they could be convicted for it. We can't have that. And that a little bit gets into, I guess, a good theoretical discussion around the extent to which First Amendment principles and associated thinking around free speech are an end or a means. Or if they're an end unto themselves, maybe you do fewer balancing tests or, well, that's just the cost of this freedom, which is axiomatic that we're trying to promote. And if people are scared, they're scared. Uh, reminiscent of one of the ACLU's more famous cases, although it's receded into the sands of history of Nazi, neo-Nazis marching in Skokie, Illinois. Um, or it's a way of saying that there's an end here different from the First Amendment's, just from free speech in the air, mm -hmm. 
which is people feeling in a position to actually have the kind of exchange of ideas that you need to ideally correct wrong impressions and learn what other people are thinking. And I guess that's where you're coming down, yeah? Well, I, I would, again, if the court were ever honest or, or if it were more honest about the fact that it's always doing this kind of balancing, that it, that it because we know famously in US v. Stevens, the Supreme Court suddenly announces that they've never done balancing, that that's never how they've decided the First Amendment. The First Amendment is itself the product of balancing, which is crazy and ahistorical and makes no sense. And it doesn't explain any of the longstanding historical exceptions that they then trot out and say, well, these five, because they're historical, are, make total sense, and we can, we'll, we'll continue to not acknowledge that obscenity is First Amendment protected, for instance, or fighting words. But we're not going to recognize that anything going forward, including things like animal cruelty videos, could possibly constitute an exception to the First Amendment, which makes no sense. Um, so yes, if the courts were actually saying we are doing a balancing here and being open and honest about how they're saying we just think the stalker speech is more important than the musicians, that would make more sense, right, if we we're actually putting those on the table, but they're not. And there's also this question of, you know, because this is one of the civil libertarian cliches about how we have to protect the speech we hate in order to protect the speech that we love, except that that's not how it works, right? You're not. When you protect the stalker's speech, you don't protect the musician's speech. You don't protect his victim's speech. You're making a choice of one above the other. So there's no, there's no neutral position of saying we're just going to let people speak. Sometimes what that means is you're going to let some people silence other people. You're going to let them harass other people, intimidate other people. And it's almost always not going to be the people that are making those decisions or advocating for those positions. They're not the ones who are going to suffer. Those lawyers and countermen are not the ones who are going to suffer what all stalking victims are going to have to suffer because of what they, they had uh, argued for in this case. So the 1977 Skokie case, I think, only glancingly reached the Supreme Court. Uh, but the outcome, I don't think the march actually took place in the end, but the outcome was the issuance of a permit or the order to issue the permit. And in, with all hindsight and in your view as the theory as you develop it, should that license have been denied or do we not know enough facts to know? I think it's hard to know procedurally about this, but I mean, when you think about how this happened, right, that there, there was this group of neo-Nazis who wanted to make these marches. They didn't actually want to march in Skokie originally. It was because they were trying to get a permit in Chicago. It was denied. They wanted, but then they decided that it would be fun, I guess, to target neighborhoods that had overwhelmingly Jewish populations. And um, Holocaust survivors Holocaust who presumably, survivors. many of whom could attest to PTSD yes. that would be brought on by the presence of Nazi banners waving outside their apartment windows. And that they, re that they went to these communities and they applied for permits to be able to march through these communities. And not just to march and, and say we have different thoughts, of it, but to march through wearing SS style uniforms and swastikas and holding up signs that said things literally that said free speech for the white man. And they also engaged in a pattern of harassment, telephonic harassment to the residents of Skokie. They would call them, they would look up all the Jewish names in the, in the, in the phone book and call them and say, we're coming for you. So let's carve out that piece because that sounds a lot like counterman. Well, um, so I, they, they apply for yeah. these permits and the, and the city says, we don't want you here, so we're going to deny the permits. And at that point, the ACLU gets involved and says, no, it would be a, a violation of the First Amendment to deny this permit. Yes. And I think this is, this is the really troubling thing about the Seventh Circuit decision that's really kind of the meat of the decision, because they basically say, well, this, the swastika, the Nazis, all of this stuff, it's just offensive speech. So the, the case that they analogize it to is another famous and I think rightly decided case, which is Cohen versus California, which is the fuck the draft case, right? Can you wear something really obscene, not obscene, sorry, something profane on the back of a jacket in a public place um, and not be considered to be disrupting public order? And the court there says, well, you know, that's, that is just a, that's part of the rough and tumble of, of speech. You might disagree. You might find it offensive. That seems rightly decided to me. But for the court, Seventh Circuit to say, yeah, and swastikas and SS uniforms marching through a town of predominantly Jewish population with a lot of Holocaust survivors, it's exactly the same thing as that jacket. That's the kind of equivalence that I think is really, really not only meaningless, I think, in some sense, but also does something to our imaginations. And that's the because you would it. take into account the state of mind of the audience. You certainly would take that into account and also the difference in what is being said. Fuck the draft is not a threat to anybody. It is not targeted at anybody. It is not invoking violence. It's not doing any of those things. It's making a statement that people might find crude, but that's it. And to say that these two things have to be treated the same because they're basically the same thing, I think is completely um, nonsensical. Mm -hmm.
we should open it up. Uh, is there? But before we oh, do, yeah. can I just say one thing? Because you did ask me, and I didn't, I didn't answer yeah, the question course. about what's a different way of looking at the the, the, yes. the genesis of this concept that I try to explain in the book is. I go back to the Greeks, right? We, we've gotten so many of our good ideas from the Greeks and try to figure out what did they mean when they said freedom of speech? We're, what did they mean about the values that were important to democracy? And I was looking at this concept called parousia and uh, particularly Michel Foucault's kind of uh, gloss on the concept that he uh, gave in a series of lectures in the 1980s. Where he says the parousia concept that is essential to democracy is not the idea that everybody can say what they want with no consequences. He says that's not essential for democracy at all. And in fact, that kind of freedom of speech is often antithetical to democracy. Parousia is better translated as fearless speech. And he articulates what the, uh, the attributes of that kind of speech are. And he says the kind of speech that's essential for democracy, not, not an answer to whether or not we can't tolerate some of the other stuff, but the kind that's actually essential for democracy is not just random speech. It is speech, he says, that is candid, first of all, by which he means you have to be taking your own position. You can't be saying I'm playing devil's advocate or I'm playing a role. You have to take up the position yourself and speak your opinion truthfully. You have to do it to someone who has more power than you. And you have to be critical about that power. You can't be praising somebody in power. That's fine if you want to do that, but that's not essential to democracy. The thing that needs to be protected, that real vulnerability, that real radical um, speech, is the kind that says to power, you are doing wrong. And it is the kind of speech that takes on the risk of that. This is back to Sophie Scholl. Even at the point of death, Sophie Scholl knows she's going to be executed for what she's done. And she says, it was right that I did it, and I would do it again. That's the kind of bravery. When I think about examples like that, people who knew that they could die because of what they were saying, that the law was not going to show up for them and did it anyway, that to me is such a contrast from the neo-Nazis in Skokie who were saying, we want to speak in this town to terrorize people. And that's basically all we want to do. It's for our own self-interest. And we're creating risk of harm to all of these people for really no reason except to advance their own view that we think that rights should only belong to white people. That is an anti-democratic thing to say. Now, whether or not we should prohibit it, punish it, et cetera, there's no reason to celebrate it. There's no reason to look at that as a model, whereas we have models like Ida Wells. We have models like Sophie Scholl. We have models all over the place that we could be thinking of as our free speech canon if we stopped thinking about the First Amendment and started thinking in terms of all the actual examples that we could think of that have involved people taking incredibly courageous stands, even though the law would not help them. It's hard to find among First Amendment discussants people who would not want to see in those terms that core of speech protected. Mm -hmm. It just then gets down to your thought that in practice it turns out not to be that way. And maybe we can all agree that in those instances, laughing at a hearing, we should be dialing up protections for people. Certainly, but also realize that when we protect certain, what I call in the book, reckless speakers, people like the neo-Nazis, people like Brandenburg, the KKK leader, it's not just to say that's not a fearless speaker, it's to say that person is endangering fearless speakers. That's the reason why those people are in danger. And when you side with them, you are also making it harder for fearless speakers to actually speak. And sorry, just last question, and we'll open it up on that. Does that mean that in your view, discovering or determining who is in the more vulnerable position and therefore it is making their speech more fearless, is that like an intersectional inquiry? Mm -hmm. Or is it one where if there is a citizen coming in front of a school board, the school board is the official entity, it's got the power, the citizen does not, it's a structural political determination, or is it both? Is it in every First Amendment case, are we trying to figure out, again, intersectionally, who the vulnerable party is or something else? So I think to say it's, it's definitely something else in the sense that I don't think it's enough to say there's a structural power, that this person has a higher position of authority, so that necessarily means we know who is more vulnerable, because it might depend on many things, right? If you are an incredibly wealthy donor, right, and you're talking to someone on the school board, I'm not sure exactly how the power um, shakes out. So we, we really do want a fact-intensive inquiry for those things. But I do think that it's uh, the question that we'd want to ask, you know, getting back to the point of what is some of the, the straightforward First Amendment work that we could be doing? It's always say when it's the government, when it's the government literally trying to punish you for your speech, right? I think about the spectacle, when we talk about college campus speech, the spectacle of members of Congress hauling presidents of universities before them and threatening them 
basically saying we will, you know, it's going to cost you your job. It's going to mean no funding for you if you don't do exactly as we say, or you don't give us the right answer to our very, very selective questions. That should have alarmed everyone who's, who cares about the First Amendment and its most easy uh, to understand form, which is Congress shall make no law. Members of the government cannot be allowed to punish and prohibit you for what you say. Right? That should be the First Amendment crisis that we're looking at, but instead we're still hearing that, oh, the problem is snowflake students. Oh, the problem is students who protest in the wrong way. But that example is consistent with the people around the dais are the powerful and the people being testifying in front of them are One less powerful. Except that that's exactly yeah. not how it's been talked about. The conversation is these members of Congress are presenting themselves as the little guy who's yeah. standing up for the powerless, and these university presidents, uh, and let's not forget, have almost exclusively been women and women of color. Um, these are the people who have all the power. Harvard has all the power. These universities are holding power in their hands, and we're just asking questions as mere, as mere members of Congress. It's completely flipped. Yeah. Uh, has the mic found a home? Yeah, please, just uh, go ahead. I can barely see the room, so. And uh, depending on uh, your fearlessness, feel free to say who you are before you start off. Yeah, hi, I'm Allison Stanger, and um, I'm at the Brooklyn Klein Center. And um, Marianne, we testified before Congress in April, so it's really great to hear about this book, and I'm excited about the ideas in it. My, my question, and I've already bought it, so. Thank you. You've succeeded in. <laughs> In. You've got a copy or you've bought the thesis? No, I, I literally went on my phone and bought it on Kindle. Ah, okay. All right. Fair <laughs> but enough. my question is this, and I'm sure you deal with it in the book. Um, let's take the cases of Eugene Dobbs. Was, was he uh, using reckless speech or fearless speech in that particular historical context? So you mean so Eugene Debs speaking to crowds saying you are you are fit for something other than cannon fodder, is that? Well, also speaking these payons to uh, the Bolshevik Revolution in wartime, which many saw as a national security threat. I would I, and I do actually talk about Debs in, in the in the book, and I sorry talk to about, call him Dobbs. <laughs> um, that I do think that those are examples of fearless speech in the sense that that was very much not part of the mainstream accepted governmental position as we know because he ended up being convicted and imprisoned for it. So I would say yes, that was those are one of the moments where the First Amendment or those who defend the, the sort of expansive view of the First Amendment sort of try to gesture at that tradition and say yes, that's why we need the First Amendment, but all of those people lost because the communist threat was thought to be such a terrible threat that it was okay to throw people in jail because they opposed the draft or thought that communism was a good idea. Which again, we would think that under modern First Amendment doctrine, that wouldn't play out the same way. I, I don't know that that's the case. I mean, if we look at, for instance, cases like, uh, I think about DeRay McKesson right now, the most recent ruling is, is finally coming in his favor, but that's after seven, eight years of litigation where he's being accountable because he um, organized a Black Lives Matter protest at which a police officer was wounded by somebody in the crowd, and he's held accountable saying, well, it's your responsibility because you organized a Black Lives Matter protest, and that drags on for seven years to see whether or not that's the right answer. If the First Amendment doesn't have a clear answer to that, then what are we doing? Mm -hmm. Other uh, questions? The dam has broken. Yes. Hi, uh, Noah John Sarkisa, a visiting scholar at Burke McCline. I was wondering if you could expand a bit on what your views are around corporate speech and maybe since we are Berkman Klein, specifically like tech platforms and jawboning and some of those issues. Oh, there's so much to unpack there. I, I, part of what I wanted to talk about um, specifically to this crowd is let's talk about Elon Musk for a second because um, who doesn't want to do that? Uh, but also uh, the, the fact that Musk in particular really brought, and I talk about him quite a bit in the book, um, he buys Twitter and says, I'm gonna turn this into a free speech forum, right? Now that's an interesting thing to say to begin with because Twitter had always you know, sort of promoted itself already as a free speech forum. And then as soon as he gets into place, right, he's like, he says a very confusing things at the beginning about how, well, I'm just gonna obey the First Amendment, which doesn't make any sense as the owner of a private platform. So one of the things that's really troubling about this discourse is the conflation of state action and non-state action, and it's happening all over the place. And you'd like to keep that separate? I would like to keep that very much separate. The First that, Amendment should not apply to private action. 
Well, if it's going to, then we need to have a whole, that is truly something radical. And what I find really strange about how easily people slip into that conversation about, well, should we change the state action doctrine? That would be fundamentally a change. And if you are any kind of an originalist, it makes absolutely no sense to change it. But if we're going to have that conversation, let's talk about, well, if it doesn't have to be um, state action, well, then I think we should be talking again about how much stalkers are uh, suppressing and silencing their victims. And then let's really throw it open and talk about non-state. Yeah, so let's suppose that we're going to keep on with the state action doctrine. Yeah. What critique then of Elon except for him being confused? Okay, so there's a lot. So I'll stick to a few though, where, whereas when he says, okay, I'm going to do what the First Amendment does, and then it turns out that he does every, what he does as soon as he gets control of the platform is he silences his critics, right? So I was like, well, so you are acting like the First Amendment, really, right? Because as soon as someone says something you don't like, you are, this is true, I think, about every First Amendment absolutist. I think I lived, you know, 12 years in, in Florida. Ron DeSantis can't stop talking about the First Amendment. And what is he doing every single day? He is literally censoring everything he doesn't want um, to hear. So I think Elon Musk is exactly the same, right? So he says, I really love free speech, by which I mean the stuff I like and not the stuff I don't. And then he says, I'm going to not only do that, I'm going to sue a bunch of advertisers who don't want to advertise on my platform because it's full of Nazis. I'm going to sue them because they're violating somehow the public square. He is sort of the perfect storm of everything I think that's wrong with the social media conversation, right? The idea that we think we know what a public square is, the fact that we think that a privately owned corporate uh, product or service is somehow the public square is, is, an, is a crazy idea. And the fact that because of Section 230, the federal immunity law, that Twitter and X cannot be sued for the kinds of things that happen on their platform, but Elon Musk can go around suing every nonprofit and individual he doesn't like because they've had some kind of impact on his business, right? That to me is, it's, it's almost like all the First Amendment dysfunction wrapped up into one. So yes, I think that the short answer is I think he's, he's kind of the perfect example of everything that's wrong with the First Amendment. And in 2024, would you prefer to be Justice Franks with four good allies, making the shape of the First Amendment, understanding that it won't reach private action? Or would you rather be Elon Musk's successor as sole owner of Twitter? I don't want either of those jobs. Uh -huh. I, and, and frankly, really? I really don't. I mean, I, and because something that some of you, if you have read other... Um, if nominated, you will not run. If elected, you will not serve. <laughs> but if it were thrust upon you and you could make a difference in the world, which one would you take? Oh, then in that case, those are my options. And it would definitely be the court. Um, because I think social media, you know, should be burned to the ground and, and salt the earth. But, but, and I, I will say <laughs> but that you could change Twitter from the inside. <laughs> no, you can't. I mean, and, uh -huh. and the reason, and some, but the reason why I think is because of something I, I talk about in my book, which is one of the more disturbing things about social media generally, and it's not restricted to Musk, is what I call consumerist constitutionalism. The, 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 the fact that the tech industry has convinced us all that free speech is a product that you have to consume on their platforms, that nothing is real unless you post it here. So every time Elon Musk is able to say, well, if you can't say it here, then it was censored. Well, that doesn't make any sense. You can, you can literally hear it anywhere else because you are a private platform. But he's doing this in part because they're trying to create this impression that they are open and everything, you know, all free speech happens there. That's not true. And we should not buy into this idea. And this is where I do analogize it to the Second Amendment. Um, fundamentalists who say, you know, your right to, to defend yourself has got to be wrapped up in your ability to buy a weapon, buy our product. So I think that that is a real undermining of freedom of speech generally because it makes us think that freedom of speech happens exclusively or most importantly yep. online. Just to understand the scope of salting of the earth you'd like to do, um, was the internet revolution defined in this case as an ability for anyone to build an audience and reach them without any ready practical interference from the government, is that a regrettable revolution? That'd be amazing if it happened. That didn't happen. The internet was created by the military, right? The internet was created by a lot of people with a lot of money and very specific US focused goals in mind. And as much as we'd like to think of ourselves, and we go back and read John Perry Barlow and he's just singing the praises of how we we're having this life of the mind online and it's like nothing else before, that was never true. But in theory, uh, we could argue whether uh, how much that has been realized, but in theory, the ability for anybody to reach nearly anybody 
understanding that it can create a cacophonous mess and then it all becomes what you get exposed to as to what you do. But anybody reaching anybody without easy monitoring or interference from the government, is there a way to assess that on balance? I'm not sure that there is because uh -huh. we've never seen it happen. And I think part of why our dependence on any number of platforms and services now is, is so troubling is because we don't know, we have, been, we have been given that bill of sale, right? We've been told that this is your freedom, this is, but what have they been doing the entire time? They've been gathering your data, they're selling it to brokers, they've been watching you the whole time. And the, when you find out that maybe it wasn't the US government, but it was Elon Musk watching you, is that better? Um, so I, I do worry about that yeah. too, is that I, I think corporate speech is bad. When I say the state action doctrine needs to remain in place, that doesn't mean I think it's great that these companies run the world. I, I, what I was starting to say before about the federal immunity problem, I think we should pierce that immunity. I think we need to reduce the immunity of Section 230 because we shouldn't let these companies have as much power as they have. But the answer is not to treat them like they're government actors or let the government tell them what to do because that's actually worse. Got it. Another question, wherever the mic has found itself. Thank you. Hi, thanks for being here, professors. Um, I'm a law student here. Um, I was interested in this idea that you proffered about sometimes speech is a zero net sum game where allowing the speech of one actor, especially if the recipient is a vulnerable, uh, a member of a vulnerable population has really irreparable harms. Um, and I'm, I'm cognizant of the fact that we're at the Rebooting Social Media Institute. Um, would you distinguish between situations in which, for instance, like Lana Del Rey music, which is criticized for glamorizing abuse and self-harm and has, and she knows she has teenage fans, that sort of situation from social media platforms, which serve content that also sometimes glamorize abuse or depression amongst teenagers who are mentally ill and um, are, uh, uh, are likely to self-harm, would you, distinguish those two circumstances somehow under the First Amendment? And if so, under what sort of reading of the jurisprudence? Is it sort of like a true threats construction, a tort construction? Um, so two parts. Yeah, Thanks. thank you. That's an intriguing question. I guess the threshold question for me would be, what are we trying to do about any of these potential harms, right? I think the easy one of the easy answers should be is that if we want to criticize these things, if people want to critique this music or critique um, whatever they would like, can they do so? And can people respond back? Can people do controversial music? I think the answer has got to be yes to that. That that really what I am focused on, especially when I'm thinking about the limitations of the First Amendment, are what are the kinds of speech that rise to the level of such harm, right? That we can actually start a conversation about whose speech rights might have to be lesson for someone else's to um, um, to exist. So I don't know what the I don't know where we would have a tort or a any kind of theory on the kinds of facts that you've just given. I don't know what the harm would be that is so concrete and specific that we would be even in the game of saying, okay, is this a First Amendment issue or not? So, but what I would like to see a lot more of is just people having more room to not have a conversation about is this or isn't this allowed by the First Amendment, and a lot more about is this good or not, is this interesting or not, or what are the different, not just two sides, but multiple sides of what music can do. And this is to me is very analogous to the college campus uh, conversation because it's part of the reason why I don't think the First Amendment is a good model. When I ask my students, what is a good classroom discussion? They never say, well, when we talk about things that are protected by the First Amendment and, and that's it. That's a strange concept, right? Why would the most interesting conversations be surrounded by the question of, would you get, could you be permissibly punished for the speech under the First Amendment? That's a very, odd and very limited conversation to have. And I would be much more interested in having conversations that were extra legal, that had nothing to do with, with the First Amendment at all. Which might mean conversations that are more fundamental about the kind of society we want yeah. and what a vision of a society in which people are going to disagree and mm -hmm. others will think that others are irrational and mm -hmm. how that works itself through that, I guess, is a starting point for what kind of legal protections would you have either for individual speakers or for the state itself or right. not in how it regulates. Right, that I think most speech questions, interesting speech questions, are very context specific. There are so few that are going to even hit the rail of the First Amendment and so few that should. Part of what's wrong, I think, with our discourse today is that there's such a quick move to say, well, that's got to be a First Amendment issue if it has to, anything to do with speech or something I don't like or someone's gotten canceled or someone's gotten criticized. 
criticism isn't center, is not censorship. Having different views about something, having really offensive views, those are acceptable. Being disruptive, that's also protected. All of those things are speech. There's such a small number of things that actually raise First Amendment issues. I, it, it strikes me as being an outsized influence over our conversations, when really in the classroom we should be asking, what are the important ideas? What are the valuable ideas? What are the counterpoints? What are some of the things we're afraid to say or afraid to think about? Those are all interesting questions, but they're not First Amendment questions. They're questions that are related specifically to that context. Just to say, it might be the job of the government, I'm not trying to put words in your mouth because you may well disagree with this, but it may not be the job of the government to be so content based, they're content neutral, gosh, I'm not here to judge whether the speech is valuable, just whether it is dangerous in this context yes. or otherwise. Um, but then it's up to people to be content based and viewpoint based and that, to that is, have a view. Part of their First Amendment right to do so. But yes, it's also what makes a society is not going to the government to figure out, is this OK or not? That's a really small question. If, it's the, if the government wants to put you in jail, it should have to answer whether it's got a reason for doing so. Yeah. But every other question, why would that even be a First Amendment matter? Got it. Before we wrap, Shelby, is there any interesting commentary or questions from the Zoom room? Yeah, yeah, a lot. Um, we have I probably think... one minute. Yeah. <laughs> um, so talk about I'm a time, place, think... and manner restriction. <laughs> right. No. Um, so forgive me in probably mispronouncing this, but um, one question is: in your work on Parisia, <laughs> um, did you focus at all on the right to equal democratic par participation? Not so much, because the, the, the concept as I understand it, the parousia concept is separate from the Isagoria concept. So really focusing on the question of the fearlessness of the speech rather than equal access, partly because I always am confounded by the, just the facts of Greek society, just like the facts of American um, democracy, which is we know that both of those democracies weren't democracies, right? They're hugely exclusive and in very similar ways. So I try to take as much from that concept as I can, but there's a limitation to it because whatever the Greeks were saying about how everyone having equal access, they didn't mean it. They didn't mean it in a big time way in very much the same way that the founding fathers didn't mean we the people. Well, that's a less than optimistic note on which to <laughs> end. Uh, so I, I just wanna end by uh, saying I've been fond of describing, uh, I call it the three laws of digital governance. Uh, one, we don't know what we want. Two, we don't trust anybody to give it to us. Three, we want it now. Uh, with an optional fourth of an AI can scale it. And uh, it's so wonderful to have actual propositions, claims, a real point of view from which you're saying, look, this is a vision of what could be a better society, and maybe even how it could be brought about, how it would be brought about and not collapse under the weight of its own tyranny, which is, of course, at least in theory, some of the animating uh, idea behind a Bill of Rights, uh, et cetera. Thank you so much for writing this book, for being with us here today, and for engaging with us in fearless conversation. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for your questions.